Hey, hey, Nation Nation, Harry here. We are coming around the corner, as they say, with spring quarter 2020 online. Of course, that's we're always online, but now online education is fashionable. We are in lecture number five on communications, and uh, we're, we're, we're taking an interesting um, turn with this conversation. Um, uh, and I'm going to be joined, uh, I'll introduce my guest in a moment, but Essentially, um, we're briefly going to talk about the different platforms, and then we'll get into some specifics. And I want you to, right now, go over to the right. Jenny, do we have the handout um, available for the people? Not sure. Jenny, if you could double check. Um, I, we have a handout for you. I'm going to go over it live, so if it's not underneath handouts, uh, bear with me and we'll get that to you shortly. Um, it's a spreadsheet with an equipment list. And then the uh, be sure to use the questions feature over in the dashboard to ask your questions. I'm going to be monitoring that very closely. And I'm sure there'll be questions because this is a popular topic. And I see Kevin Hunter's coming in. So without further ado, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm running a TV studio here, folks. <laughs> I have four monitors. Um, without further ado, we'll jump right into it. Again, I'm Harry Brailsford, SMB Nation, know the crowd well, and I'm joined by Carl Guest. So Carl, uh, we grew up in Alaska, went to elementary school and beyond, and uh, found ourselves in Seattle, um, the uh, great migration from Alaska. I migrated in 89. Carl, when did you migrate to the lower 48? Well, I started in Portland, uh, and then we boomeranged to the East Coast for graduate school and wound up in Seattle in the fall of 95. Okay, there we go. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us what your day job is. So, yeah, so when, when I'm not hanging out with my friend Harry, uh, I'm an executive presentation coach. So I work with CEOs, I work with executive teams, I work with what HR likes to call high potential employees and basically make them better presenters, both inside their companies and outside their companies. And I don't think I need to tell this crowd of how difficult it is uh, and how agonizing it is when you go to a presentation that you're really excited about and it just drags and it doesn't work or the presenter is distracted. So my job is to try and fix those things as much as I can. Yep. All right. And we're joined again by uh, with Kevin Hunter uh, down um, just uh, north of the state of Oregon border. Um, Kevin, where are you at today? What's your story? Uh, you've been on the show before. I'm in a secret undisclosed location bunker. No, <laughs> I'm in my uh, home blue screen studio today in the Castle Rock area. And broadcasting through a kind of complicated system for a lot of people who don't have access to high-speed internet there's such a thing as constructing a tower and doing it through the cell system so that's uh, how my connection is working today and i'm a longtime uh, creator in the youtube circles and um, came from a media background into doing uh, online content and uh, had a great deal of success with it and uh, living the dream so to speak that's right, and people can uh, find you on YouTube is just with your name, Kevin Hunter. Um, and Kevin and I do uh, t uh, Tech Tuesday, so he has a broadcast network called Northwest Digital News, and we typically would have had our show two hours ago at 10 a.m. Pacific, and we decided to do a joint presentation today. So this is both Tech Talk and uh, Tech, Tech Tuesday and Tech Talk. Kevin. <laughs> It's these words are all too close together for me, man. <laughs> so the first thing I want to do before we get into the list is, uh, as I said in the abstract, um, the MSP Tech Talk abstract for communications, that initially was going to kind of be almost a little bit of a bake off between Zoom and 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 go to webinar and WebEx and Kevin, you you use vMix. I mean, there's a, a number of platforms out there. And what I decided about 10 days ago, so I wrote that quite a while ago, and, and, and it was a real issue, Zoom bombing, and everybody was scurrying to get home and so on. 
that conversation is actually fairly mature now, right? That, okay, got it, got it, I got it. Zoom, okay, or, or, or WebEx and offers and incentives to use the platforms. Um, so I don't know if we want to go around the horn. Uh, we use GoToWebinar, and that's more from a legacy point of view. I would like to explore Zoom. Not sure I have fallen in love again with WebEx from Cisco. That feels uh, a little, well, expensive to say the least. Um, Carl, what are you seeing out there in terms of just a high-level platform discussion? Well, I, I am on a call three or four times a week with a group of AV professionals who, who get pretty acerbic pretty quickly about the platforms that they like and they don't like. Um, so what I would say is at this point in time, uh, Zoom's pretty good. Um, there, there are others certainly, certainly out there. Vimeo, uh, it, you know, gets good marks. There are, there's legacy stuff out there that people don't have particularly great things to say about. Uh, on 24, for example, or Amazon Chime doesn't get a lot of thumbs up in the circles that I travel in. That being said, my philosophy as someone who delivers presentation and delivers information is I'm not a technology expert and I don't have any intention to be a platform expert. So what I tell my clients is whatever you want me to deliver on, I will promise you a clean signal. I will give you material in whatever fashion that platform can support because I, I think all of us who work in the vendor world understand is we don't have subpoena power over the organizations. We can't walk into an organization and say, well, you need to really scrap WebEx because you're behind the times. Those decisions have budget implications. Those decisions have a lot of people attached to them. So that being said, if I'm looking down the road, and I'll certainly be interested to hear what Kevin says about this, I think the landscape's gonna change again pretty significantly six to eight months from now. Uh, okay. I, think, I think Zoom has had to scale really, really fast, but I think Zoom has a target on its back. And I don't have any inside knowledge, but I can't help but think that a lot of very well-known brands are dumping a lot of money into serving a space that really didn't exist prior to the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, some thoughts. You are in a slightly, you know, different line of work. And, and um, in fact, Kevin, hold, hold on a second. Let me kind of set the table. We're here today to talk about setting up for yourself and your clients, your home studio, your home TV station. Now that has become a thing. And uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. Kevin, you're in a slightly different line of work with a real broadcast studio because you put out uh, car buyer videos and so on, use vMix. But to dovetail off of Carl, uh, what, what's your philosophy on platforms at the high level? Well, several of those that uh, Carl just mentioned will work for the typical person that's out there. And so I wouldn't necessarily be suggesting something like vMix that we use here in studio for them. In fact, if they're thinking of live streaming, want to go to um, multiple streams, you know, there's there's Restream out there, there's OBS, that's one of the uh, open broadcast source software yeah. they can use, you know, for things that we do. So there's those there. And then to just kind of mention briefly about Zoom, um, Zoom was largely an unheard of uh, idea or platform not that long ago. And it really has been the pandemic that has brought that out front because you hear people talking about Zoom meetings all the time now. But yeah. it wasn't that many years ago that people were Skyping each other or doing, you know, the go to webinars. And, and you know, one of the, we, I've actually done a lot of that stuff in the past. I don't do much of it anymore. So I'm not the best person to ask about any of those kinds of platforms um, sure. right now because I don't use much of them. But I can tell you that my past experiences using platforms like GoToWebinar or Skype or others is that some of them would tend to hijack your cameras, um, your audio feeds, that sort of thing. And you could then potentially have problems launching or connecting via other platforms that are out there. So you always had to be aware of that and always had to make sure that you shut those down entirely before you try to connect. So if, if somebody right now, um, just to throw an example out there, if somebody's attempting a Zoom call right now and having difficulty with it, and they had go to webinar on their computer at one time, 
they might want to go in there and actually shut down go to webinar entirely and that's probably what their problem is so and and i've had that i've had that with you on our tech tuesday show um where i called it kevin the weekly reboot <laughs> right <laughs> to just clear the buffer folks if you look over in the chat window and we're going to go ahead and leave the uh the platform discussion behind but in the chat window um you're seeing uh two things let me get that up there first is varvid.com so longtime community member aaron booker uh you'll remember an msp out of bellingham washington he he's still here with varvid he has changed his market from going to wpc and trade shows and um interviewing msps and, and computer people and he's now uh doing connected events so hybrid events um producing them and Aaron is a resource. That URL, you can reach out to Aaron and find out about other platforms that are more specific to events and, and hybrid events. Um, you wouldn't necessarily use Aaron's services or his recommended platforms for your daily meetings, but uh, that's one consideration. Um, so shout out to Aaron. The other link is uh, Carrie Holtzman, uh, who's developed quite a DIY uh, do, do it yourself audience in the tech space and that's his youtube channel where i was on an interview with him about a month ago and that is in skype so he uses the skype platform that you'll be able to see on that link and and feel free to uh bookmark that and watch it another time so that's kind of the platform discussion now before we get into the spreadsheet so folks we're going to get to the good stuff and again, I am monitoring uh, questions if you have them. Um, oh, no love for Microsoft Teams. Don't get me going, Derek. With Microsoft Teams, uh, I do not have love for Microsoft Teams right now. Now, I have the right to say that because I've worked with Microsoft since 89, and I, in particular, do not trust them in the telecom area, okay? They had response point. They had some other telephony solutions. Um, and with Teams, uh, my frustration is um, I, I always feel like we spend 10 minutes in a 30 minute meeting trying to get everybody on camera and audio and oh, 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 try, try, try again, try again. Um, and that's uh, frustrating. Derek, raise your hand if you would like to come on live. This is another thing we're doing with the four monitor setup. If you're in a position to come on with a Microsoft and uh, microphone and camera or microphone and uh, Jenny will bring you in and you can talk a little bit about your experience with Teams. So feel free to do that. And Jenny, if you could see if Derek is in fact raising his hands. Um, now, that said, while we wait for Derek to raise his hand, uh, Carl, I'm going to go back to you. Sure. So again, you're in the line of work of, uh, and, 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 and correct me if I kind of get it wrong, but you're helping executives be presenters and then we had and and, and by the way they need it <laughs> if, if these walls could talk let me tell you <laughs> um and you know you have some really good uh catchy lines like uh give a speech like you're talking on the weekend and and and, and that kind of thing i've taken a lot of that to heart then the pandemic hit and your right. business model changed so now you're also in uh, a community of AV specialists. I think you alluded to that, where you're helping um, executives set up home studios and then how to present from a home studio, and you're doing it yourself. What is your story in the studio you're building out in the background? Well, so the, 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 stu the studio that you can see a little bit here uh, has been... Uh, a, a seven or eight week, sometimes Sisyphusian exercise in rolling a boulder uphill. Uh, I, I I consider myself to be knowledgeable enough to be dangerous. I was lucky enough to have consulted with Grass Valley for about 10 years, which is one of the biggest and really most well-respected brands uh, in in video. But video is very different. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of moving parts and things. You can do a lot in software, you can do a lot in hardware. Um, but by virtue of hanging out with these folks, I've, I've, I've learned a, a, a couple of things. Um, 
and, and, and we'll get to the equipment side of things, but part of it is we're all working out of the house. And so yeah. there's a theory in improv comedy that you have to accept the reality. And so we're not all working in pristine set aside rooms that we've built in a warehouse. So geometries are a thing. Uh, is it better to take a triangular slice of your office and do this? Or is it better to carve out a rectangle? So you spend a lot of time going, okay, there are things I can't change. Let me try to work around those as best I can. Um, my personal philosophy with building this studio is that when I used to work at, walk into a conference room, my gear was better than anybody else's. My slides were better than anybody else's. Uh, my backpack that I had backup equipment in was often heavier than my clothing bag that I put in an airplane. And the reason is, if I'm going to convince somebody to go online and to give a remote presentation of a high quality, then mine has to look really good from the other side of the glass as well. And that's sort of been the philosophy as I've been building out my studio. Yeah, yeah, I can appreciate. There's what I wanted. Kevin, um, what a timely topic. Again, you're at a, a different level, but you have actually built out a studio recently. Why don't you tell us about that experience a little bit more, um, and we'll see where our synergies lie. Well, let me back you up there a little bit on that. So are, are we wanting to start with more of a low-level structure where somebody on a budget uh, can put together a studio, or where do you want to start this? Well, that, that's actually a valid point. Um, on the screen, folks, I have, and I'm going to increase the size of the spreadsheet. This is the handout you're going to receive, and it has two tabs. It has the $500 hauler, and it has the $5,000 studio, and we're going to go through both. So, Kevin, it's probably a good, uh, as good a time as any to take us down this rabbit hole. Um, and so... Kevin, this is the list you prepared for me, and we can kind of get into the weeds on that, but let's kind of talk at the uh, philosophical level. When I started working with you um, two years ago, I said, make me a CNN studio. So when CNN calls, I'm ready to go, man. I'm ready to offer my opinion in the box, the CNN box, as I called it. Pick your cable news provider. Doesn't matter. It's all the same. And you gave me this list, and I did all this for under five hundred dollars. And uh, basically, let's let's talk about it because um, we are with a, a technical audience. The first one is the high-speed HDMI to mini uh, HDMI cable, 4K resolution, 15 feet. So, what does that cable do? Well, for, for people, let's let's start with equipment somebody may have already. So a lot of people have these handy cams, um, and it could be a Canon or it could be a Sony, it could be whatever. Many of them do have a mini HDMI out, you know, on the camera. And yeah. so instead of using a webcam that might be sitting, you know, right in front of you, and your audience is sitting there looking up your nose during the whole presentation, um, <laughs> you could consider using your handy cam or like a webcam sony whatever put it on an inexpensive tripod and set it back from you a little distance and then you can use this mini hdmi out um you could you could uh in some computers because of the graphics cards you have them if you have a really high-end computer you can take signal out of a camera directly to a computer but i don't recommend that people necessarily do that because um if you go through something like the uh agb tech device or the elgato that um harry has listed there those uh those devices will do a lot of the processing of the data for you um and maybe make up for some of the deficiencies your graphics cards may have um and and allow the computer to run more efficiently see so, so it's less glitchy um so you're going to run from that hdmi cable into a uh encoder if you will and then it's going to run from that in a a short short as possible um usb cable into your computer now, one thing I, I want to mention to you, because this is actually really, really important, and um, Harry and I were actually talking about this earlier today, and it's quite funny how even people who are tech savvy sometimes will miss this, but if you look at your computer, there are different types of USB ports on your computer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some of them could be the older form, 2.0s, 
which is based, I think they're 48, 480 megabytes per second is the processing rate. That's that's the good port to plug your microphone into. If you're coming from like a, a Blue Yeti microphone in a mini USB cable and then over to USB, you yeah. can go into that 2.0 port and that audio will process no problem. That's it right there. So, yeah. however, if you take your camera cord and plug it into that same port, you're gonna have all kinds of problems because the 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 data rate coming from your camera is quite a bit different than the data rate coming from a microphone. And subsequently, if you look on the side of your laptop, if that's what you're using, or look at the ports that are on your computer, you'll see a nice little SS uh, above that USB symbol that's telling you that you have a super speed port. Or if you look at the color of the little slot inside of there, if it's blue, it's also a 3.0. So the process rate of a 3.0 port versus a 2.0 is about 10 times faster. That's the one you wanna plug your camera into. And so okay. if you're noticing on your broadcast that you're getting camera flicker or that it's glitchy or things like that, there's a really good chance you just plug your camera into the wrong port on your computer. So start with that uh, sort of thing. So you already showed the um, Blue Yeti microphone. So let's say if, if somebody starts with their Handycam with that cable and that AGP tech going into their 3.0 port, now we're gonna plug in a uh, Blue Yeti microphone that takes a mini USB underneath and that plugs yeah. into your slower audio cable uh, on the computer. I have that cable just off screen, folks. Hang on. All right. So those two things, the microphone, the addition of the microphone and the use of the other type of camera, those two things alone are going to give you a much more professional looking. So there, if I can get this right, there we go. So there's the audio cable that would go to the blue yeti mic again this will be familiar to a lot of people in our audience yeah all right so those two things alone i mean you take into consider consideration your backgrounds like the background that carl has there you see in the background behind me uh, a blue screen um blue screens are not expensive this uh, a, a 20 foot by 10 foot blue screen fabric uh, is actually um under 25 bucks but there yeah. is a little bit of consideration and hanging the thing up. Like the, the wall that's behind me is framed by um, one by fours all the way around. And that packs the uh, blue screen away from the wall by uh, three quarters of an inch. So the wall is framed by one by fours all the way around. And then on the inside of that frame is uh, carpet foam. And then I blue screened over the top of that. And it basically eliminates a hard surface behind me so that I'm not experiencing sound bounce. It will reduce, um, you know, that kind of really echoey, closety kind of sound, you know, that you hear a lot. And um, so just taking into consideration a couple of things. I want to mention this because while this is a very common thing to do in a little bit higher end studio, you can also do it uh, within your $500 budget studio. So let me give you a couple examples. On the ceiling directly above me, I have a white ceiling in here, and I like the white because of the the what it, the effect that it has on lighting. My ceiling is white, but it's white carpet, so that's one of the things that helps prevent sound bounce. And then going down the two walls on both sides of me, um, going down those walls are carpeted by a warm flesh color carpet as well, so that it doesn't do funky things to the color of your skin, your clothing, etc but that goes down both walls. So I'm basically sitting in a, if you if you think of like a, a shape of a room, this is a rectangular shaped room, but my end of the room is carpeted top and bottom, back, both sides. Carl, you have strong feelings about sound. Yesterday when we had our rehearsal, uh, you in, in particular had feelings about sound. So what what is sound, Carl? <laughs> Well, sound is anything that your microphone can pick up, and and microphones are very, very good at picking up sound. And in fact, we were just having a discussion in my AV group this morning about even when you have uh, so-called unidirectional microphones, that doesn't guarantee you that the sound that you're trying to avoid or that you're trying to get uh, is going to come out the way that you want it. Sound will go around corners quite nicely. So. Uh, to tag on to what Kevin said, and, you know, I, I get the budget considerations. I think, you know, first of all, 
for both of our studios, what you don't see is a high speed connection. You know, I get a fiber drop to my house and for video, and this is something that's a little different for what we've been used to is we've always looked at the download speed because it gets the Netflix movie there the fastest, but with video, you've got to push it upstream. So the figures that I'm hearing, and again, I'm not an expert, is at least 10 megabits per second on the upload. 50 on the download is really nice. I'd like more. I have 50 on the upload side uh, and usually about 100 on the download side. I was lucky that fiber came to my neighborhood and the moment it did, uh, I, I, I wired it in. Um, that leads us to sound because you can have great audio uh, and kind of middling video but you can't have pristine video and terrible audio. Yeah. It, it, people just can't process that. Now, what I do with, with my setup is I use a headset mic because I want it really close to my face. I wanna minimize any noise. Remember, I work at home, like a lot of us are at home right now. Yeah. I don't want the garbage truck on the alley behind me to bleed through. Uh, Kevin uses carpet. Uh, I found a very interesting product that I'm going to be ordering in the next couple of days. There's a foam manufacturer that will do custom cuts of foam. And if you oversize it about a quarter inch, then you can pressure fit it to your window casing. And if you want to pay a little bit more money, they'll put a six millimeter layer of neoprene on the back side. So it'll really start to bounce any external sound away. The other thing that I do is that my microphone goes directly into my camera. And the reason I do that is to eliminate any audio video synchronization issues so that mm -hmm. everything that's coming into my computer is coming in on one channel with everything tied together. So we could have an internet storm, but it's not going to blow my audio and video apart. Everything may get fitzy, you know, if somebody's deciding to hack the NSA today but it's not going to blow everything apart. Interesting. Uh, That's a really good point there is, is syncing your audio and video together because there's a, you see a lot of stuff that gets posted there and um, you'll, you'll watch the speaker be synced up with their data, you know, their audio in the beginning, and then they gradually go out of sync. And by the time you get to the end, you wonder, who who are they talking to? Because <laughs> they're they're so out of sync with their audio, and that's terrible when that happens. And so people have to recognize that in video, you know, there's the MOV extensions, there's the AVI, there's the MP4 in the audio side, there's the MP3, there's the Wave. All of these have um, different, if, if maybe in layman's terms, better, they have different concentrations of data per second of data produced. And when when you start trying to pair up audio files and video files and they're running at different rates you, you might look at your your end audio and your end video and go wow well, they're the same length and you put them in the, your software together and you're wondering why does, and nothing matches up um yeah take into consideration a really simple approach is exactly what carl mentioned is run it through your camera for those people who are because I, I separate them, but we have the expertise on how to do it. And I wouldn't suggest you try to learn that, okay? Um, but we've done this for several years. We separate them for anybody who who does that, where they might be taking an audio feed and a video feed uh, from two separate sources and they haven't paired them up together. You always have to remember that the computer that you're using, anything that's hooked up to it that has a microphone, it recognizes that as, as a microphone. There's a onboard microphone now there's your camera microphone and then there's the microphone that's sitting in front of you and if you don't go into your system settings and disable the microphones you don't want to be using doesn't matter how great the microphone is sitting in front of you you're still going to have that echoey junk sounding audio because the other two devices are listening and adding to the the static in the in the system so you have to be aware there in your system settings you will have to go and disable other audio sources and if I could Folks. just tag in there for just yeah, a quick sec, Harry, you know, the, the, the early Apple employee, Guy Kawasaki, uh, who actually coined the term software evangelist, has this concept of a pre-mortem. And I think this is something for all of us to remember. You know, I, I'm a big believer in building a dedicated area to do your video work in um, because right. then you can set it and forget it. But the kind of stuff that Kevin's talking about, you know, getting online, talking to somebody, you know, getting your family members online and testing everything out, 
because there are going to be those moments. Harry and I were talking. I had one today. There's a silly little setting in Google Calendar where all of a sudden I was getting a bing bong. You know, all of those kinds of things, you've got to weed those out uh, so that you come across as in as clear in a compelling fashion as you can. Yeah, exactly. I, I want to mention um, something else really quick, Harry, before yeah, we move on. Yeah. Um, Carl mentioned the upload speeds and how important that was to video. So I want to share with you, um, having done this multiple locations, uh, many different situations, the minimums that he was giving there as far as the uploads that you want to be looking for, um, that 10 megabytes upload speed as being a minimum would be if you're broadcasting only to one platform. And then the, the moment you attempt to use something like StreamYard or Restream and you're going, I want to go to Patreon and I want to go to Vimeo and I want to go to YouTube and I want to go to Facebook. Well, uh, those things are not going to happen unless you have very fast upload rates. Um, so you're, you're probably the minimum when you go to multiple platforms. Um, if you have anything that's slower than that 15 to 20 range, probably get your internet upgraded, then try it those multiple platforms so you hear all these discussions about people broadcasting multiple platforms but if you don't have something that's very adequate in the upload far more important than the download well you're going to be in trouble yeah yeah uh, a couple of thoughts uh one back to the blue screen kevin so my experience has been um and and i'm just right now static with the uh the the, the proverbial bookcase um but what I found, and I need to work on this, but with the blue screen, so you're talking about a hex color, right? Uh, colors have a, a value. Mm -hmm. And where the blue screen would kick in for me is when we go to post-production with Camtasia and you right click and do an extraction based on the hex value. Here's my challenge, is that your blue screen by design is consistent. It's the same hex color, you've got good lighting on it, I'm I'm in a home office and maybe the sun highlights a little bit more over here and the lamp over here. And so it's not the same hex value and you get a little bit of pixelation, right? When you do the extraction and then I put a photo of the Port of Kingston, you know, it's gorgeous. I look like I'm out, you know, in an office with a window view. But Kevin, I can get, it It it, it gets a little wonky. I, I, I don't even know what word to use. <laughs> And Carl, maybe you want, you know, let me let me let me help share something with you really quickly on that. Then it's not a complicated thing to filter out a blue screen, and it's not complicated to filter out a green screen if you properly lit your background. And a lot of people think of their lighting and they light themselves um, for a given broadcast, but they don't think about their background. So what's behind me that you don't see is eight feet of light that's on the floor that lights the blue screen from bottom up. And then right above my head, I can just about touch it, is a bar with another eight foot LED light that lights it from the top down. And then there are standing bars left and right um, that are also same height, floor to ceiling. So there is a light box all the way around. And then in the corners, because you don't get uniformity even with that kind of a frame, in the corners are spots here, 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 and here and they hit that little light streak that would be like a, you'd see it as a like an X on the background behind me if those spots weren't in the corners. And so there's a, there's a total of eight lights behind me. And, there, and it's not a big deal. Uh, Cost-wise, it's not really expensive. These uh, LED lights are what, $25, $30 a piece. They're, they're not expensive. Um, but if you, you got to take the lighting consideration back there and, and by lighting it the way that I am, I can go into any software that has a chroma key filter. I, I put the X, you know, closest to my shoulder because the light difference, interestingly, is always most different closest to the subject. And so I'll take that, um, take the X and put it very close to the subject in one click if that background is properly lit and the blue screen's gone and very nice and clean. So if you're noticing that you're having to do a lot of filtering or adjusting or cleaning up edges and stuff like that, I can tell you that 100% of the time it's your lighting problem behind you. Carl? Yeah, I you know, I use a 3-point LED lighting system from Aperture. It's it's a little bit more expensive, but I think the point that Kevin's making and it really leads you to the third most important thing that you need to be worried about is your lighting. 
you know, again, you're trying to minimize distraction. That's that's all we're doing with studio setups because you're you're doing it, you know, Kevin's doing it to make his point about a particular car, or particular aspect of automotive. I'm doing it because I want to teach people how to be better presenters. I'm not doing it because I want to play around with lighting all day, but the reality is if I don't have some warm tones to my face, if I don't look like I'm in something looking like a professional environment, uh, I'm going to wash out. You know, the the camera does a good job washing you out absence of, of lighting. And there are you know, really expen inexpensive lighting rigs around there. You're seeing a lot of ring lights that people are using. They're they're not terribly expensive, but getting getting your image to look good. A and the other thing, and we, you know, probably it's never been talked about on one of these calls before, is makeup. You know, mm -hmm. We yeah. coach all of our clients <laughs> You know, usually there's a professional hair and makeup people. I know, Harry, I'm just, I've just scared the daylights out of you. But uh, you can take a photograph of yourself and send it to Mac, the cosmetics company, and they will come back with a, a, a makeup kit or a makeup application for you that will fit your skin tone. And I made sure that I did hair and makeup before I got in this call, because otherwise what happens is you start to look a little ghostly. You start to look a little pale, even when a, with a good lighting rig. So those, those things are, you know, they don't always have to be expensive, but the lighting is a critical part of just coming across in a professional manner. Now, that's interesting. Um, hey, before we get too far from sound, uh, what I wanted to show the audience, and I mean, I literally keep it right here on the floor, the Yeti, blue Yeti manual. And you go to the middle of the manual and it has four settings for the microphone. And Kevin, um, what, what what's of interest for our purposes is we have had to play with the settings. So you remember when I was at IT Glue in September, uh, before you know it, a year ago, down in Phoenix, and I had the mic and we were doing an interview with uh, one of the program managers. Well, that's a very different setting. That would appear to be bi-directional for an interview versus, they say cardio, cardioid. Um, that was more of the podcast when I'm maybe speaking this way, just me speaking. And so there's all these settings and, you know, I, I, I don't know what each setting does. All I know is with Kevin and Jenny, I'll try all four. Hey, how do I sound now? Better? Did the bird chirps go away from the lot right next door? Great. <laughs> um, Carl, uh, do, you, do, you, do you drop down to that level? And, um, and do sound checks and that kind of thing with your absolutely. clients. Uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, our back back four months ago when we actually used to venture out into the real world, uh, we would do individual coaching online. We do some in person, but we would do online dress rehearsals before we started. And then, of course, you do on-site dress rehearsals. We talk a lot about standing up when you present, which is what I do, because it increases the airflow in terms of your ability to project to a big room so oh yeah we do you know i i do mic checks all the time uh you know you and kevin and i got on yesterday because i wanted to make sure i came across well one of the considerations this is not a knock on yeti you know i've got call i've got coaches who use yetis you know i use a headset is be aware of your room you know, you can do a Yeti microphone or a tabletop microphone, but if you've got a lot of hard surfaces, and Kevin alluded to this earlier, if you've got hardwood floors or concrete floors, floors or a lot of glass, that room's going to boom on you, and, and you're going to hear the echo coming off of, of the walls. So this is why, you know, you can record yourself, you know, run a little quick time recording of yourself while you're speaking into a microphone and listen back, see how much echo you're picking up. You know, maybe there are some ways that you can change the mic around, do some room work really inexpensively, uh, or maybe you end up moving to a headset just because you can't fix the room. And again, the improv theory of accept the reality, sometimes we can't fix the rooms because they just they just came with the place. We, we'd have to do a complete and total teardown. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, we're going to get back to the uh, the spreadsheet with the details. Uh, we're uh, got about 20 minutes left. So folks, 
what we're trying to do, speaking of improving our TV broadcast paradigm, is bring you on live if you have a question that worked really well with the recent event that we had and, and we're making that our standard. You can certainly type your question in over on the control panel. Um, I have put a couple more links over in chat. So those are two uh, hybrid conference platforms, a little bit different beast, but these are two that Aaron Booker at Barvid recommended. So that's over your chat window. I am trying to find uh, one of the things I do with donating my time, well, Carl, as I told you, I'm, I'm trying to be less evil, okay, moving forward. <laughs> but for, for the record, none of us considered you to be evil in the first place. How about just more good? Okay, because the Seattle tech sector gets a little rough at, over across the bay, but in any event, always good for a chuckle. But um, Carl, you're, you're probably where, I think, Kevin, I think you are, but like I do virtual field trips to a Texas llama ranch. I've done three of them for K through five students. And what was fascinating, I, I, I just, I love the new paradigm, you know, new paradigms and chaos create opportunity. There's no question about it. And these teachers, uh, in fact, uh, Carl, Becky Harrison Drake, I don't know if you remember the Drake mm -hmm. family in, in, in Anchorage. Uh, she's sure. a career mono, yeah, career kindergarten teacher. She reached out for a virtual field trip to the Texas Llama Ranch. Here's what's fascinating and the point I'm going to make is that you had people doing the extraction or whatever you want to call it with Zoom. So they were putting the artificial backgrounds behind like a blue screen concept. Um, bail me out on what that's called, but you can change your background in Zoom and kids will be kids. And so good Lord, the backgrounds they were changing to, no, it wasn't naughty or anything, you know, these are, it's all good. But, you know, one had a little toy llamas as background while I'm lecturing on llama. I mean, kids will be kids. <laughs> I just, we are in a whole new world. Any thoughts on, uh, uh, before we move on to the details uh, background, we've covered sound, we've covered uh, the video, we've talked about backgrounds, any transitory thoughts? Kevin, why don't you start and I'll tag in on any small thing after you. Well, I, I would just, um, th there's all kinds of different backgrounds that you can use. Harry, I, I even mentioned, uh, to you that I had a 10 foot window down here that was available if you wanted to use it. It's it's the Seattle skyline with the space needle in it. I had yeah. a, a hired a photographer to shoot a really nice high end. Um, that one was shot in something that would be comparable to like 12K when you think about it. So it's a, it's a photo that would sit on a billboard and still look super crystal clear in yep in uh, resolution so but I had that produced as a background um, for when I was doing shows that were specific to the Pacific Northwest and then I use a lot of blue screen background the studio that we're working on um, right now in uh, Longview is very close to being finished that's going to have a brick wall around the two sides of the studio and then there will be uh, big screens that will actually display things during a live broadcast that will be in the center portion between myself and the guest. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with background, but my suggestion would be to people, at least initially, to not overthink it. Be, you know, develop your skills in the trade, become good at what you do, um, practice a lot. You know, the Carl mentioned about um, you know having a, doing connection with your family and others. You know, before you go live with professionals. Really good idea. You know, even when we, you know, as, as much as we've done this, if we make software changes or hardware changes or doing whatever, we'll have members of our staff go outside and call into our software or video into our software. And we'll make, we test all those connections before we're going to bring somebody else into it. So um, just make sure you do that kind of stuff. And uh, I, I, and we'll probably go to this in a moment, but I wanted to talk um, briefly then about, because Harry, you've put out there, here's your $500 option. Um, Carl put out a bunch of equipment suggestions. That's maybe your $5,000 option. I really want people to think about this just a little bit, because some people might be going, you know, I want to do this on as much a shoestring budget as possible. And here's what I want you to think about. If you're going to go open up a brick and mortar business anywhere, what's the least amount of money you need? And if you said, 20,000, I'm going, you're kidding yourself. Uh, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, you know, half a million dollars. How much money do you want to take out? 
to start your brick and mortar business in town? Or do you want to take out five grand and start your business at home? I, yeah. I would say that stop thinking about it in such small dollars, take it seriously, uh, put together something that is very professional. And I, I think the clients you attract and the paycheck you earn will reflect exactly what you put into what you're thinking about right now. So I would, my suggestion would be lean towards the high end, not the low end uh, when you're doing this. Yeah, Carl, a friend go of mine, ahead and uh, then we're gonna get back to the spreadsheet, go for it. Sure. Now a friend of mine puts it this way, you know, if you've got a car and it comes with a sunroof, buy the car with a sunroof. You may not ever open the sunroof, but you can always open the sunroof if you want to. Uh, I can't agree more. You can get me jumping up and down about practicing in advance. I mean, what none of you saw is that I was rehearsing out loud before this presentation. What you can't see is that I have notes on screen to remind me of some of the things that I wanted to touch on. And if you look at it from a business point of view, how many dollars are riding on that next call that you do with a client? And, and contrast that against the cost of putting together a studio and all of a sudden, you know, it, it, it's a really easy call to make economically. It pays for itself when you're delivering a high quality product. So buy the sunroof, you know, there are workarounds. Some of you have equipment spares, for example, because you're in this business. Okay, so you've already got your computers, you know, do it progressively. Make sure your wireless con connection is good. Then work on the microphone. Invest in the lighting. Learn about the lighting. This is an area that I'm still uh, learning and tweaking. You know, try to make yourself look as as good as possible. And then we can talk about cameras. But prepare. I mean, I I just did a uh, lecture last week to 65 college faculty, and I was on camera every day rehearsing and practicing what I was gonna say. And you don't need a kit to do that. You, you all have phones that record video. Set them up, record yourself, see how you come across, fix the things that you don't like. That's the business that I'm in on a regular basis. And then you're gonna bang out really good, crisp, clear video calls with your clients. All righty. So, Kevin, what is an Elgato? It's on the screen. It says a capture card. What's an Elgato and why do I need it? It's essentially an encoder and it's doing the work that your computer would be doing in terms of being able to use and convert that video file. So, you're plugging that between the HDMI cable that comes out of your camera and, you know, it then on the outside of that, on the outlet side of it, it's plugged into a high speed USB. You want to use like a blue cable or something that's like a 3.0 cable or faster. And it's going to come out the other end of it and plug into the backside of your PC. And again, into one of those SS ports or a blue port for your camera. And folks, what I've done is it's I basically create... making up for some hardware deficiency you may have in your computer, essentially is what it's doing. Folks, when you get this list that you see on the screen, I have the links to Amazon for you to purchase everything. So this is the $500 hauler. Let's let's get through this. Um, Kevin, I like the way you describe this fella. So this is for this would be for llamas that spit. Llamas are from the camel family. So when I interview llamas, you have to actually put this in front of the microphone because they spit. Is that a fair analogy? <laughs> a spit filter or pop filter, if you want to think of it like that. There's a you know the that type of filter um, you don't necessarily need if you know how to use a microphone and you understand uh, how a microphone works. A lot of people will even how they position a microphone or if you hand them one in public, they'll hold on to it like it's an ice cream cone. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, microphone does not work well held like an ice cream cone. You need to hold it like it's a sucker. So you're going to hold it out in front of you and then you have to recognize how that air flows you know, out of your throat. So the air is going to go slightly down at about a 15 to 20 degree angle from your face, it's gonna go down. So the minute you hold that microphone right there, you're blowing into it, popping it, making all this racket besides your voice. So you need to get it slightly above your air or slightly below your air or to the side of your air. But if you, if you watch a professional singer singing at a concert, 
they don't have that thing stuffed, you know, in that in that angle or sitting down here like a like an ice cream cone. So just understanding how a microphone works and then keeping it out of your wind pattern, you can avoid the pop filter altogether. There we go. Uh, I'm now showing the camera uh, line on the spreadsheet, and I want to tell you why uh, Canon. So, so here's the deal. I was using a Sony for many years, and this was actually given to me in a kit by Aaron Booker. So the kit had all the components in blue. That was one kit, and then red. We used to do a bunch of stuff together, and uh, Aaron very kindly let me keep this. I burned out the camera, and it took a long time to figure it. The camera still works, but what happened is here on the uh, the USB port, it just kind of burned, it, it got old. There was a little bit of wiggle, and the wiggle had the effect of uh, decorating the video or losing the video, and I, I'm rebooting, and I'm starting over, and doggone it, one day I said, well, to heck with it. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, Take Kevin's advice on the Canon that you see here. I got it for uh, just over two hundred dollars on Amazon on that link, and um, now now I have two cameras because this actually works and this is not bad to have as a B roll. Um, so I actually did a little of that recently. Uh, folks may or may not know, but my sister married her longtime partner, Dr. Bob, on Whidbey Island on May May twenty first. Did a two camera shoot. And I used the onboard storage for this, and then I used um, the Canon as the main camera so I could get a little A, B, and B roll going. It's kind of cool. Uh, but Kevin, one thing I noticed uh, that surprised me up in Whidbey was, and I had to scramble pretty quick, is the Canon that we have listed here does not have onboard storage. You have to put an SD card in. Um, because I'm primarily using the Canon as a, a camera to flow into Camtasia, or in this case, go to webinar. But that one did ca that, that 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 one got me. And uh, is that how they're holding the cost down? Why why would there not be onboard storage? We have to remember what a lot of people are using that camera for. So it's used for a lot of remotes or places where you don't have access to power and. So that that's stored like on a 64 gig chip or something like that. And it's easy then to just open that port, pop your chip out, put it in your computer and you have your you have your video. So that's how that camera was used a lot. The the fashion in which you're using it with your HDMI out and into live stream um, onboard storage actually isn't even necessary to use it. Yeah. No, no memory chip is necessary to use that. You can just open the camera up and um, let it fly. I wanted to mention something really quickly because you mentioned about the Sony and developing a connection problem with that. Anytime yeah. you're using a, a camera like this or even high-end cameras, you have all these cables coming out of the backside of your camera, um, or maybe it's just a couple, it doesn't matter. These cables do put a lot of strain and a lot of weight on the ports that they plug into. And so you can't see this, but the camera that uh, sitting is out in front of me has actually four cables that come out of it. There's power, there's a HDMI cable, there's a, a audio cable, there's others that are in it, but they're all straps. So you can buy you these little packs of uh, Velcro straps and they're not only bundled together so that the it helps stabilize this cluster of cables, but then the cables are also strapped to the uh, um, tripod right below the camera so that it minimizes the stress that it puts on the port they plug into. So there's a lot of things that you can do to make sure that you're not wearing out that camera, you know, plugging and unplugging things and then having a heavy cable hanging on it. Yeah. All right, so we have five minutes left and I wanna get now to the $5,000 hauler. Let me make this Let's just a that. little bigger. Um, Carl, take it away. This is uh, your contribution to the conversation and I appreciate it. What's going on here other than we're spending more money? Well, <laughs> It, it, it's probably the biggest thing for my purposes and the way that I work in a conference room is that we embed uh, a lot of video clips in the workshops that we do. So we'll take clips from The Daily Show or Last Week Tonight with John Oliver or 60 Minutes interviews and we'll use them as a teaching tool to say, hey, this went really well when Michael Lewis, the author, captured the essence of his book in 29 words. 
didn't give you the whole book, but he gave you a good part, gave you the, the everything you needed to know in 29 words. When you move to online delivery, uh, different platforms handle embedded video differently. Uh, Zoom, for example, maximizes for photo resolution ra rather than frame rate. And so you can get yourself into a bit of a pickle when you're trying to push video clips through Zoom. So the only answer to that right now that I'm satisfied with is to use what's called a video switcher. And it, it does exactly what it sounds like, which is that it allows you to toggle back and forth between the camera view that you're seeing right now and a separate MacBook Pro that's running my slide presentation with the embedded video. And the switcher acts as the, as the homeroom hub for this. And what makes it different than probably what people are used to is that once I am, uh, it, it just acts as part of my camera feed to the Zoom call. So I don't have to go into share screen and share my slides and then worry that the slides aren't gonna play back the right way because I didn't check the system audio box when I went into share screen. My whole feed is coming into Zoom or WebEx or whatever as if it's my camera. It rides on that connection. And so I'm toggling back and forth using that ATEM Mini. Now it's not here yet because Blackmagic is a very popular manufacturer of equipment, and there has been a surge for A10 Mini, A10 <laughs> Mini Pro. Uh, the cameras are available, uh, which is a good thing. And you know, I know we're we're a little short on time, but one thing to think about with cameras, the first thing I'd say is you're going to evolve with your equipment list, just like you did when you were kidding out your home computer setup. You started one way, you added stuff over time. I think everybody's going to do that. Uh, there are two things about my camera setup that are slightly different. One is that I don't use a tripod, I use a monopod with a C-clamp on it. And the reason is, is that the tripod just took up too much space in my office. And so that's a nice workaround, that's a nice MacGyver to get that camera in place. Mm -hmm. The second thing I do is I use a lens that's almost as expensive as the camera itself. It's an Olympus lens. I think it's a 12 to 40. And the reason I went that route is that I wanted to frame my shot for the camera. I didn't want the camera to frame my shot. And what I mean by that is when you get into a fixed lens, then all of a sudden you're having to move the camera around a lot to get the shot that you want. You may not always have the space to do that, but with a zoom lens on a camera in a fixed spot, then all you're doing is adjusting the focal length of that lens, maybe the iris a little bit. And the other cool thing, and, and then I'll stop yapping about cameras, is that there's a Bluetooth application for my phone so that I can do my color adjustments and my white balance and my iris levels so that if I do get variable light coming from the window that you guys can't see that's six foot wide and it's really difficult to block it, then I can make those fine level adjustments in the camera while I'm looking at myself on screen. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, thank you, Carl. And um, folks, you're going to get this list. Um, so, you know, we kind of went through the $500 hauler, and then this is the one where you can step it up to the next level, uh, what Carl's doing. Um, I see a hand raiser out there with Jonathan Handler. Jonathan, uh, did you have a question? Um, and I can uh, bring you on if uh, that works. There, there we go. Jonathan, how are you? Oh, boy. I had that for a previous webinar, so I uh, hmm, I don't understand how that. Oh, I'll switch it off. Did that yeah. do it? There we go. Well, yeah, Jonathan. Did, okay, no problem. So we had a false flag there on the question. Let me just look over, folks. If you had, we 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 hit it around with Derek earlier about uh, Microsoft Teams. Last chance for questions, Jonathan, no problem. Uh, Lu Lucino Castillo, uh, we have a hand up. Um, did I get the name right, Lucino? 
see if we can raise that individual. We have a hand up uh, from that individual. And I'm just going down the list. Hello, Ron Hardy. Hey, there's Uli from Maui, Hawaii. Thanks for joining us. So I think we're clear uh, on the uh, on the questions for today. So Jenny, if you could Gary, go ahead and- Gary, we just received one more question from Derek. So let me bring Derek oh, up. Yeah, yeah, Derek. There we go. Hey, Derek. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. I, I, I appreciate you asking questions. I hope you don't mind me giving you a hard time on Teams. Sir, What what's your next hey, question? Well, <laughs> you know, so it's, I'm happy you did this uh, session. Um, it's very timely for us. Um, we're actually internally working on doing a podcast. And um, I've been reading a lot lately. And one of the questions that seems to come up is, you know, whether you're newbie or not, they recommend different different type of microphone. So I figure you got two fantastic experts here and I've recently um, kind of got back and forth between should we be using a, uh, uh, was it condenser versus the dynamic microphone? Gentlemen? You have thoughts on that, Carl? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I you know, I'm, I'm going to say you have now led me to the part of the pool that I don't swim in particularly well. Um, mine, mine has been a trial and error. I've been lucky to, um, you know, to have a little bit of expertise in in selecting this road mic. But Harry, if you'll allow me to expand that just slightly, because um, yeah. I definitely wanted to make sure that, especially given the, the, the topic of this talk is, you know, how do you take advantage of this to expand your markets? Well, it's really not that different than what you used to do. You know, you, you provide equipment directly, you provide value added services and then you provide support services on top of that and i think one of the ways to get more comfortable and get more knowledgeable is to start seeking out the audio video professionals in your area so for example in the puget sound area out of everett we've got dve store and they have a ton of people who review to the question they review a lot of microphones all the time if left to my own devices, I would have pulled a microphone off the shelf from B&H that was half the cost of this one, but I'm already hearing that it's got connector problems. So I think partnering with people and then maybe even thinking about bringing those people in when you're trying to customize a package for whether it's an individual or a company on a consultative basis just makes you look that much better and probably expands your portfolio of business. You know, to that point, not long ago, I was at a an event where they had some national keynote speakers, the people who set up the audio and the video for that uh, matter, but for the audio in particular, had bought a relatively low budget wireless mic systems. They were cutting in and out the whole time. The, uh, the thing that I would really point to, so you're asking questions about specifically the type of microphone. I prefer condensers myself and that's what I use, but you have to understand that when you're using a condenser, uh, things like gain versus volume. There's a, there's a whole bunch of things that will be uh, different with a condenser than with other types of microphones, but I do prefer the condenser. But I think the, the better question would be, um, are there brand names that are well-established, well-known in this industry? Uh, sure is one of them. Um, Carl mentioned he's wearing a, a Rode headset. It's R-O-D-E. They're very well-known in the audio area. Um, probably the lowest budget you should be looking at in terms of brand name out there is Audio Technica. They also make a lot of really good audio uh, equipment, and I wouldn't spend less than than what an Audio Technica mic would be. If you if you start going, there's all kinds of um, offshore manufacturers of uh, uh, Pyle is a is a it's a great name for them because P Y L E is how it's spelled, but Pyle Equipment is a pile of you know what. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't buy any of their stuff, no matter what type of microphone it was. And so I it's it's really important. So my my point would be uh, stick with mics made by Sure, by Rode, uh, at minimum by Audio Technica, and you're gonna like the audio you get out of that a heck of a lot better than any of this low budget stuff. And this kind of goes both to your studio setup, your camera setups, your mic setups. Um, this goes to a statement that I, I'm stealing from Zig Ziglar when he said years ago, if you spend less than you should, you lose all your money. If you spend more than you should, you only lose a little money because it's the difference in what 
you were supposed to spend and that little bit of loss on the top. I, I would think higher than lower on all of your mic and your camera equipment. All right, yeah, final thoughts, Carl? Well, just to tag on to Kevin, uh, I would stay away from wireless microphones. That's just my personal preference. I like hard connections with cables that I can have backup for. I don't want to be fighting you know, some bit that got twiddled somewhere and all of a sudden my, my wireless signal is, is bouncing around. Um, but I do think you're going to see more requests for online work. Uh, we're seeing it already on the education front, college campuses. They're not all going to open the same time. We're seeing it already in the corporate world where some employees aren't coming back at all uh, or they're coming back in a hybrid fashion, work from home. And as I said, I've seen it in my business. So I think there's business out there. Uh, and again, I would reiterate to start really making inroads with your your AV professionals in your area because they've got a lot of knowledge, they've got a lot to teach you, and they can be a great partner when one of your clients comes to you and says, "Oh my gosh, you know, we don't even know how to set this up." It's like, oh, "That's okay. We we've got the right people to do it." You know, to All Carl's righty. point, even in our area, there are several guitar center stores i have actually visited with a lot of their audio experts and and i would consider them to be on the lower end of the audio professionals but even them they they will know a lot more about microphones um and and any audio connections than you know your your typical uh lay people so if if you were to ask me should i go into best buy and talk to them no uh, at minimum go to a guitar center or a place like that that deals in 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 the equipment and if you can find a good audio professional in your area, go talk to them because that, well, that's money well spent, time well spent, and you'll love what you get for it. The other thing you can do is get on a phone call with B&H Photo in, in New York City that because they yes. hire experts to do this, but also don't be afraid to send something back. You know, If it doesn't work, if it doesn't give you the quality that you want, put it in a box and send it back. That's just the reality of building out a good operation. All righty. Well, let's make that the final word. And folks, uh, Aaron Booker at Barvid and Bellingham is a resource for you in the same vein. He's always been a, a outstanding community member. So we're wrapping up uh, class number five, and this was about uh, a very timely topic. We call it communications, but it's it's one of the hottest opportunities um, out there for yourself as an MSP and also to deliver to your customers right now as work has changed and we, we have this need. On Thursday, uh, we're gonna wrap up spring quarter and we have a conversation on IoT and drones. So we're gonna have a little bit of fun before we send you off for the summer and we'll see you back in the fall. In the fall, we're gonna do the NIST cybersecurity framework. With all that said, we did run a little bit over, but it looks like we had uh, uh, high levels of engagement. And uh, gentlemen, thank you for bringing your expertise. Thank uh, you. Jenny will send, yeah, Jenny will send you the spreadsheet in addition to the replay link tomorrow. And uh, away we go. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.